here. <laughs> um, I also want to especially welcome the speakers. Not everyone is here yet. Um, at least one speaker got stuck in Kansas this morning. Um, another one's Amtrak train was delayed and his taxi's probably going to get here any moment. Um, and I stalled just long enough that I can recognize Dr. Strand from the uh, Chester Environmental Partnership, who's joined us today. Um, also, Tracy Carluccio from the Delaware River Keepers Network. Jeff Tittle is here from the Sierra Club. Jocelyn Sawyer from the Food and Water Watch. Alex Baumstein. Alex is not coming. Alex is not coming. And Fred Millar is in a taxi on his way here, we hope. <laughs> Um, also, I want to uh, thank Dr. David Lehman, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, for agreeing to let the college sponsor or co-sponsor the event. I want to recognize the Widener students who are here today and all of the members of the Chester and the local community who have come to join us. So, because this is an open forum, I, I just want to know, and I know that some of the students may have classes, so when you need to get up and leave, please just do so without making a ruckus. And then um, it looks like we've got enough seating. If a bunch more people show up, we do have an overflow set up in another building next door. Okay. So I want to start briefly by just making some connections in particular for the students here. I know there are some students who are in my chemistry class or took chemistry from me. Um, I want you to know that you will see things today that we talked about in your class. Those of you who are in organic chemistry right now, you should know the structure of methane or Dr. Baston's going to get you on the next exam. <laughs> I'm sure of that. Um, but there are also probably some students here from environmental science, and so the things that we talk about in terms of climate change and global warming should be very familiar to all of you. Um, do we have any chemical engineers in the room? Yes? Okay, so not only are you going to recognize the chemistry and the environmental science, but also the things that are, would happen in this plant, the way natural gas is fracked, the way the compressors work, the way these systems and processes work. These are all things that you design in your classes, so they should be familiar. Or they will be familiar by the time you graduate. Um, what about uh, anybody from business or political science? Yeah? yeah. All right. So. You all should be seeing connections to the things that you're learning in your classes too. And so that's why we're having this forum here today, is um, sort of as a learning opportunity for the students, but also for a chance for people in the community to hear about how this facility could impact our local area. And um, so that's my opening remarks. Jimmy May, who's the one who was stuck in Kansas, was going to talk about the connections between what's happening here and the legal issues that his law students would be dealing with. Um, and then I want to introduce Tracy to uh, open up the meeting. So thank you very much. Well, uh, those of you who are not a part of the Chester community, I'd like to welcome you to Chester. Uh, we're a community that are environmentally active and very much concerned about the quality of life for our residents. Uh, many of you might know some of the work that has been done to the Chester Environmental Partnership uh, that has uh, been uh, a, a great, great help to the community to keep the community from uh, clustering of unfriendly environmental facilities in our community. Uh, we're, we're happy to be here to hear the presentation and to participate in this conference because we realize that if we do not uh, get involved and we do not uh, make ourselves knowledgeable to the things that are going on around us, we fall victim to them. And uh, we like to deal with things before, amen, become a victim. 
hopefully we can stop them before it gets to that point if need be. Thank you so much and uh, we thank you again for uh, coming to our community. Thank you, Dr. Strand. And for those of you who are not part of the Chester community and may not know, Dr. Strand has been uh, running the Chester Environmental Project Partnership for how many years now? More than you want to tell us, right? And anyways, this is a group that's been actively involved in working with the local community and industry in the area to um, make sure that the industry in the area is not having a negative impact on the city of Chester and that they're working together as partners. And so thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Now, Tracy. <laughs> yep. Push the button on the keyboard. That should do this one? Yeah. Hello, I'm Tracy Carluccio, I'm Deputy Director of Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and we thank you all for coming out today. Great to see such a good turnout and such a diverse uh, member uh, representation from the community, uh, both of Chester, people here from Philadelphia, people here from the Gibbstown area in New Jersey. Uh, we have people from the state of Delaware here today. We have students, we have young people, old people. Uh, we have a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds here today. And we're really happy uh, to see that because one of the reasons that we wanted to have this forum in Chester is because we want to raise the profile of this issue so more people will know about what is being planned. And Chester is the closest concentration of people in an urban center to the Gibbs Town Logistics Center, which is the uh, proposed export terminal for liquefied natural gas. You're only 2.4 miles away from Gibbstown. And when Fred Millar, our expert in LNG and hazardous materials, arrives, um, he will explain you know, what the dangers are associated with an impact zone around an LNG facility. And uh, we'll go into that and we'll have questions and answers, as you can see. Uh, we have time for questions and answers and then some discussion about uh, what can people do to get engaged. And uh, there's a lot of people who are concerned about this from different areas. So we, we want to offer ways that people can connect and get engaged on the issue. So this is just to orient us so you can see. Um, the circled area is where uh, the project area is. Uh, there was one uh, dock that was proposed just to the north of that that says Crab Point. That's dock one. That's been approved for the Gibbstown Logistics Center. And it's under construction. The dock is pretty much complete, uh, but the land side construction is not complete. They've been going in and out for months of the facility with fill because it's in the floodplain and they were required to raise it up out of the floodplain. So that activity has been going on, uh, much to the consternation of the people in Gibbstown, uh, because it, those trucks are going, uh, when I was there, one, one truck a minute, but at least 45 trucks an hour in and out of the facility carrying in construction equipment and fill in dump trucks right through the town of Gibbstown. Um, and then that circled area is where they want to build the dock too. And as you can see, um, the river is right there, and we have Pennsylvania and New Jersey it's divided by basically where the navigation channel is that was deepened in order to allow deeper draft ships to go up and down the Delaware River. Um, and then you can see that, that area there um, just below the circled area. That's the area on the land that would be developed. It's about 200, at least about 260 acres. The whole site uh, is about 1,600 acres, and it was a munitions uh, facility where uh, Munitions were manufactured by DuPont. Uh, it was actually built in, in the 1880s and was operated until about 20 years ago. Um, you can see where it, sh it shows um, the little hatched areas uh, south, ju just uh, below the circle, uh, that those areas are now wetlands. Uh, they were probably wetlands early on, but they've returned to uh, a remarkably natural state because the site has been fallow for so long. 
And that orange area you see is the community of Gibbstown. It backs right up um, to the uh, project site. The property is actually where you see that big green area. That is the uh, pro part of the property um, that is within uh, the developed uh, footprint or the to be developed footprint. And the town, many of the homes, their backyards uh, are just adjacent um, to, the, to the property. As a matter of fact, there are 75 homes um, and or businesses that back right up to the property. So um, it's right really within there. Um, so the, let me give you a quick background on the history of the Logistics Center. Um, back when the site was shut down, there were some other uses um, after DuPont was there for some time. Uh, and eventually, all, pretty much all of them left. Um, and it was under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act to be cleaned up under the New Jersey DEP. And the cleanup started uh, by Comores, who is the spin-off company from DuPont that took on most of the cleanup activities that were required by all the many, many, many sites that DuPont has across, uh, across the nation, but particularly in the Mid-Atlantic, um, that needed a cleanup after being used, many of them, for over 100 years. So that uh, development um, was ended. A couple decades went by, and uh, the, the site was bought by Delaware River Partners, a subsidiary of New Fortress Energy. And the site then was put forward through the local municipality first, and then through all the various permitting agencies to build one dock and bring in primarily uh, what they call roll-on, roll-off automobiles, uh, other sorts of dry cargo, perishables with a refrigerated warehouse, um, bananas, basically, uh, uh, vegetables, um, things that anything that they would be able to um, provide a, a terminal for, for marketing and shipping in and out. Um, so that, that project, we were actually opposed to it, and some of our other uh, colleague organizations who are here today um, we're also opposed to it um, because we did not feel it was necessary to build another terminal when just uh, about three miles upstream was uh, the, the uh, Paulsboro facility, a terminal that was looking for customers at the time. So we felt it was redundant and that we should really uh, plan more carefully to make sure that um, we, we don't overbuild an area and we don't disturb areas we don't need to, but also we were opposed to the, the uh, export of natural gas liquids, which was one of the cargo that they were planning to use at Dock 1. And that's mainly uh, butane and propane, ethane, um, and of course Marcus Hook, as anyone around here knows, uh, you know, does that kind of business big time. So um, we were opposed to that um, because we did not feel it was necessary, but also um, because of all the damage that fracking causes throughout the Marcellus shale fields and other places. Uh, the gas that uh, would be brought here would most likely be from Pennsylvania and the Marcellus shale fields where uh, communities have been devastated by the impacts of hydraulic fracturing. And then also because of the climate uh, change impacts and the, the uh, urgent issues that, that we have all been facing, uh, with changes as a result of climate, uh, we were opposed to the development of any fossil fuels that would contribute those greenhouse gases to the problems that we already have, um, uh, mainly atmospheric warming and all of the cascade of environmental issues that come from that. And you're going to hear about that in a little while uh, from Jocelyn Sawyer. So um, we were opposed to that. They did get their permits. Uh, Doc 1 was approved. Um, Back then, just anecdotally, um, there was reported in the newspaper and also at meetings that we had attended um, at the municipality, uh, the idea of bringing li liquefied natural gas in and out of that uh, terminal. And it was rejected because basically the townspeople, including the mayor quoted in newspaper articles, said that's too dangerous and our, our, our residents are not really supportive of that. And the idea was dropped. At least we thought it was. Because in the end, it really wasn't. What we found out through Freedom of Information Act request is that Delaware River Partners, without anybody knowing it, in 2017 made an application to the US Coast Guard for approval for ships carrying LNG in and out of the Gibbstown facility. Now, we feel this was a classic bait and switch. We've seen this many times by big corporations, and this was a classic. They said they were going to do one thing that didn't sound so bad, to pe especially to people who were going to be impacted because they live around there, 
and they ended up doing something else that was much more dangerous and had the potential for affecting not only the people in the area, but the entire region and increasing shipping exponentially. So um, we feel that because Delaware River Partners has not been um, straight with the public and has basically tried to um, move ahead secretly these applications, that it is most important now that we be paying attention. And when we found this out, we basically shouted it from the rooftops. We started, we filed right to know requests. We got a lot of information from various agencies. We found out that New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, for instance, knew about it back then in 2017. We found out that the Army Corps of Engineers knew about it, maybe not originally, but they did find out. In the meantime, they never said anything. We found out that the Delaware River Basin Commission was probably the last agency to know, and yet they were the most important and the first permit they needed to even move forward. Uh, and when they found out, they didn't say anything until they were called on it. And as a result of this subterfuge and the public not knowing about it, we were all really deprived of the opportunity to weigh in and to discuss this as a public and whether or not this was a good idea for the region, what were the environmental risks, uh, what, were the, uh, you know, what was this project really going to do to the area and, um, and to the Delaware River. And as a result of continuing to look into this and then the first uh, moving forward of a permit, uh, the public did start to get engaged. And the Delaware River Basin Commission, it's a water resources agency that's an interstate slash federal agency that oversees the entire Delaware River watershed responsible for protecting the water resources of the watershed from New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. That agency, the DRBC, did give the permit back in June. Now, Delaware Riverkeeper Network, my organization, has appealed that permit and we're in court on it right now. Um, also, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection um, after a bunch of stops and starts and some uh, opportunity for input from the public ended up giving a permit for the waterfront development permit and the water quality certification. These are very important permits that they would need and would not be able to move forward without either. But there are still eight more permits at least that are needed, really important permits such as the Army Corps of Engineers, who would be the federal agency that would be in charge of what's called the National Environmental Policy Act permitting process. So that's, a, that's a, a process that's supposed to bring the public in and take a big look, a cumulative look, of what the impacts of a project like this would be in total on an entire region, including the Delaware River and Bay. Um, so that, and also uh, the upstream impacts. We argue that always NEPA should consider the upstream impacts, which means the impacts of the fracking that produces the gas that then gets liquefied and brought down to, to Gibbstown. So, um, we have been engaged on this. They still have a, a lot farther to go, uh, but in the process, we ha can share some information. We found out, uh, and really early on found out, that what this company was planning to do, New Fortress Energy and Delaware River Partners, was build a liquefied natural gas liquefaction plant in Wyalusing Township in Bradford County in Pennsylvania, over 200 miles away, in the Marcellus Shale Fields. And the idea that this company had is that this is a niche. Everybody's building these facility liquefaction plants right on the coast and putting in the ships. We're going to build it in the shale fields, and, and nobody else is doing it. So we're going to get a lock on this. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem is that then you have to transport it. And transporting li liquefied natural gas, as you'll hear from our expert Fr Fred Lamont, uh, Millar in just a few minutes um, is very, very dangerous. As a matter of fact, um, it's so dangerous that it's banned nationwide by the federal government on rail. Uh, and I'll talk just a, a, briefly about a special permit uh, that made an exception to that. But what, so, so at, we're facing now at this moment the, the, a unique situation where the liquefied natural gas is created or liquefied, manufactured in the shale fields, brought by truck at this point, and then eventually by rail across Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and then down into Gibbstown, where it will not be stored, but will be offloaded, or what they call transloaded, directly from ships, uh, directly from the trucks, through uh, pipes into the waiting ships. Now, Dock 2 has two berths on it. Dock 1 had only one. So 
we are essentially going to see the ability or the potential for tripling the activity at that site. So if you have these ships being filled constantly, and they said it's going to happen 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you're going to hear from Fred Millar, what's wrong with that? You are expanding, extending the opportunity for accidents if you have that much time and you're transloading. Each ship will take about 15 days to fill. Normally, a ship takes one day to fill when you liquefy it at the plant, at the coast, and put it into a ship. So we are exposing not only our own region here, but all those who live along that transportation corridor to the dangers of liquefied natural gas. Um, and then the other thing that I think we, we need to just, I want to just spend a couple minutes on is, we think it's going to be about, or in excess of about 5 million gallons a day of liquefied natural gas that will be actually come through there. Um, and that's an average because someday, you know, they're filling some days, it's not every day. Um, and there will be, according to um, reports that have been done uh, specifically for Gloucester County for the building of a bypass road, 1,650 truck trips every day to get this product in there. And that includes the natural gas liquids, because remember Doc 1, I said they were going to be always carrying some natural gas liquids uh, in and out, coming in by rail, which is legal, um, and or truck, and then being taken out by ship. And those natural gas liquids and the liquefied natural gas would add up to over 5 million gallons a day. Um, as far as all of the motor vehicle traffic in and out of the site, according to the county report, 8,450 trips by motor vehicles every single day in and out of this site. Really not that big a site. Um, I want to show here where you can orient yourself. Uh, the red X is the Gibbstown Logistics Center. And that's where the proposed Dock 2, which would allow the LNG, LNG is not allowed at Dock 1, it's only for Dock 2, that's where it would be located. And then across, you see Chester, you see Tinicum Township. Tinicum Township is only one and a quarter miles away. And there's a little island, Tinicum Island there, which is a stone's throw away. So it's, everything is very close and actually as close to Pennsylvania as it is to New Jersey in terms of impacts to communities. Um, now let me just give you a, a, one other um, piece of information that is important. Uh, this company, New Fortress Energy, they're very aggressive. Um, it's run by uh, a, a hedge fund manager, Wes Edens, and his partner, Mr. Lasbury. They're very politically connected, um, and they have been very aggressive in developing their markets. They're planning on sending this liquefied natural gas to the Caribbean. They've also said they want to send it to Angola, to Ireland, to other places as well. But by sending it to the, to the Caribbean, specifically in Puerto Rico, they also have a Jamaica facility uh, that they, sent, they are already sending it to from another location. But the, if they go to Puerto Rico, they don't need to get Federal Energy Regulatory Commission approval because it's considered to be a domestic transfer and not in need of that or Department of Energy approval. Another way that they're getting or escaping oversight that they really should have. But what they did, because they could not move this by rail, which is quicker, um, maybe less expensive, not necessarily, um, than trucks, is they applied for a special permit from uh, PIMSA, the Pipeline and Hazardous Safety Materials Administration, to move by rail in old rail cars, 50-year-old design, uh, liquefied natural gas from Wyalusing Township in Bradford County to Gibbstown, and they got their approval. Now, I just have to say, this followed on the heels of an executive order from, issued by President Trump that he wanted liquefied natural gas to be approved uh, by PIMSA uh, within 18 months. And that, was, that, that time is approaching, and because of that executive order, we believe it did really grease the tracks for the special permit that was given to the subsidiary. Again, it's a subsidiary, subsidiary of New Fortress Energy that got the permit, Energy Transfer Solutions. Um, but it also uh, resulted in a bigger, larger rulemaking that would change the rules, take away the ban on moving LNG by rail, and uh, allow it to be moved all over the nation by any company. That's not been decided yet, but the special permit has. And the reason that's really important is it means that they will be able to bring in up to 100 rail car, it's called a unit train, 
uh, trains every day. That's what they applied for, and that's the approval they got into Gibbstown. And they could also bring in trucks. So we know now that they have actually managed to get some of the approvals they need for the transportation, even though they do not have the liquefaction plant built yet. It's been permitted, but not built. And they also don't have their approvals for Dock 2 for the LNG handling and shipping. Um, Jeff Tittle is going to be speaking about the environmental impacts. There are 45 acres of dredging that needs to be done. There's a lot of environmental disruption that needs to be done in order to make this happen. Um, and uh, the last thing I'd just like to say is that this is a contaminated site. As you can imagine, uh, manufacturing munitions for over 100 years leaves behind a lot of pollutants, nitrobenzene, aniline. It's also one of the largest, if not the largest, source of PCBs to the Delaware Estuary and Bay, and that's as, as a result of the Delaware River Basin Commission um, a study and process uh, that identified the various sources of PCBs under a federal uh, requirement uh, for the Delaware River Basin. Um, so this contamination is another issue that we're very concerned about, because if you're mucking around on this site, if you're uh, dredging, if you're changing the physical nature of the, within the footprint of this uh, development, and the, and the contamination is still there, the pump and treat systems, the groundwater pumping is still going on by Comores, what is that going to do in terms of moving those pollutants around and perhaps uh, uh, moving them out into the environment where right now they're not? Um, so at this point, I'd like to um, thank, you, thank you for listening to the background. It takes a little time to run through it. Um, but I'd like to, uh, oh, and I just do want to show you what these ships look like. This is a picture from the Delaware River Partners, one of their applications. This is what the dock would look like. It's actually sitting out in the water, and it's a metal trestle. Um, and then you can see the, the two ships they have sitting there. Uh, you actually can see Munz, uh, Tinicum Island and then Tinicum on the other side. Uh, this is looking at it as if you were standing on the shore at Gibbstown on the New Jersey side of the river. So it kind of gives you an idea. Um, the ships that they would be using are, are what's considered to be the most commonly used today to move liquefied natural gas around the world. And we'll talk a little bit more, and maybe during questions and answers, about all the problems with that out on the seas and the markets for that. But you can see um, this is the midsize. Uh, there is a bigger ship, and then there's also uh, uh, ships with ISO containers on it. Um, we don't uh, know what they'll end up using. This is what they're saying now that they're planning on using. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm going to uh, now invite up Jeff Tittle. He's the director of the New Jersey Sierra Club, and he and I have been involved in this from very early on, the last few years, and he's going to fill you in on environmental, local, and regional issues. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, so Jeff, Jeff Tittle, um, director of New Jersey Sierra Club, but I also have another interest. My grandchildren live only a couple of miles from here in Wallingford. So what happens in this area affects me very personally. Uh, and I just wanted to start out and just sort of ask some questions for the people in the audience. Um, do people in this area believe that we ha don't have enough air pollution? Um, do you believe we don't have enough hazardous uh, facilities? Um, how about, do we have enough toxic sites? Um, is there enough water pollution? Do we need more? Uh, do we need to lose more habitat um, for um, different species, and do we need to, you know, threaten our river? And of course, the answer is no. Uh, we're here today because this project is a massive project that's going to have major con consequences to the region by both the safety and environmental um, impacts. And I just wanted to start off and say that if I had a little ping pong ball in my hand because of how big LNG expands, that if it warmed up, it would fill up this entire room. Just that ping pong ball, it's 620 to one. So think about that. In order for that to work, they have to take natural gas from fracking and all the pollution from fracking, and other people talk about that, and all the water pollution from fracking, and use a tremendous amount of energy to cryogenically freeze it down from something of this room to something about that size. And so that in itself makes us almost an energy negative in a lot of ways because of the amount of energy. But the other important parts, you know, to this region 
and I wanted to do a couple little safety issues because we've been involved in LNG, and I go back to when they wanted to build two floating islands off of New York Harbor back in the 80s for LNG terminals. And, you know, and we've also been involved with one up in Boston, but when these, when these tankers are in port, or coming up and down the river, there's major safety issues. And part of it is because if there's an accident, whether it's deliberate, accidental, threat of terrorism, it could be catastrophic. So in Boston, for instance, when the LNG tankers come in, they close all the bridges into Charlestown, where the port is. They put the National Guard on it. Logan Airport does not allow planes to take off. So the reason I'm saying that is because the Commodore Barry Bridge is right here, and the Delaware Memorial Bridge, and the, and the Philadelphia Airport's there. So you know, just to understand that piece of it. The other point, too, is that I, the number of trucks that they're talking about I think it's larger because when I've looked through the literature, most of the tanker trucks take between 1,750 gallons to 2,000 gallons. So when you're talking about 5 million gallons, it may be substantially larger. But even taking that number of 1,600, which is they're putting in, that volume of truck traffic, and think about the roads around here, crossing the Comrade or Brett Barry Bridge or the Ben Franklin Bridge or coming on 295 or uh, coming up 95, coming out of Bradford, Pennsylvania. A tremendous amount of pollution to an area that already has too much truck traffic and pollution. But the other thing is, we all know our roads can get slippery and there could be accidents. And so you think about if something like that happens, you know, they say the blast zone for one of those trucks is about 600 yards. So, you know, think about it that way six football fields. And so there is a real safety issue and a real environmental issue, and it'll be talked about later. But I wanted to kind of get that so you get to understand what we're talking about. This is a massive facility. And the amount of methane that they're going to be venting to keep it regulated in those trucks and other things is going to have a major environmental impact. The truck traffic alone, we're in an area that's F level um, by, the, um, by the Lung Association for Air Pollutants. So you're going to have even more pollution added on. Uh, you have a river that's coming back, but when you resuspend over 600,000 tons of dredge spoils, for that process, you're going to be resuspending PCBs, metals, mercury, lead, uh, nitrobenzene, and a whole other things getting back into the river and getting into our fisheries, impacting shad, impacting eel, impacting striped bass. Also, building these piers out there and these ships will have a potential impact on endangered species uh, like the Atlantic sturgeon and also the threatened species like the short nosed sturgeon. Also, this area, because a lot of it has come back, even though look, there's contamination. There are a lot of species in this, known in this area, from the, from the bitter tern to the potential uh, the Jefferson salamander to uh, the red shoulder hawk and others. So there are a lot of species involved as well. But it's also the water quality impacts that that will have that you have to really you know think quite a bit about because again, um, you know this is a very close knit area. And I wanted because we were very much involved in Fallsboro, which is right next to Gibbstown. When the, when the vinyl chlor a chloride tank leaked, because we're talking about rail too. And when that leaked, what happened was 23,000 gallons vaporized and caused evacuations and health impacts. If that was an LNG tanker, Fallsboro would not be here. Because what happens with LNG, it's super cold. It's, you know, minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and it spreads out like a cloud and lays close to the earth and suffocates anything around it and freezes things. It's sort of like Folger's crystals, freeze dry to a crackly crunch. And I'm not trying to be facetious here, but I mean, that's what happens when it's so cold. And then any spark or energy can, can alight, could ignite a fireball. And that's why it's so dangerous. They were, you know, when they were talking about the one off the coast of New Jersey, you know, they were talking about the potential impact in New York City and that, and, you know, a small leak many years ago in Cleveland of an LNG tank flattened 43 city blocks. Uh, we've had tankers almost blow up, and you know, and, and we've had also tank trucks blow up uh, and catch fire in places. So there are there is a real safety issue, and that's an environmental issue too, because of all that pollution that would come. Not only all of the time, even if it's a minor leak and it's caught in time, there's a tremendous amount of pollution that comes from it. Um, you know, we're here also because. You know, we're in ground zero for sea level rise. So Delaware Bay is considered one of the most vulnerable estuaries in the country uh, for sea level rise. The Delaware Bay shore is losing a football field a year of wetlands. Uh, you know, 
close to wetlands. Plus, it's you know one of the most important migratory bird um, stops on the eastern seaboard, where over 150 different bird species uh, go there, and, and many of them are in you know, danger, like the red knot. Um, and so the increase of greenhouse gases from well, from this facility and from the fracking and that and the trucks and everything else will add to that. And the Delaware River itself, if sea level rise keeps happening at the rate it's happening, the city of Philadelphia's water supply will be threatened. Because right now, you know, during the dry months, the saltwater line comes up to about the Commodore Barry Bridge. There are times other droughts which come up close to the school. And as sea level rises, and we're talking about a sea level rise for this region of potentially you know, three feet in the next 50 years. In fact, in Rutgers did a study and they said that New Jersey could possibly by 2100 see a sea level rise of 6.4 feet. If that happens, not only will this facility go underwater, but that saltwater line will move up the river threatening Philadelphia's intake. And that's another reason why climate change is, and dealing with greenhouse gases, since methane in particular, is 85 times worse than CO2. You know, and so, you know, even though this, when you hear the other side talk about, you know, oh, it's safe or there's not going to be any environmental impacts, it's really weird that a facility that has so much cold gas that the, that the, speech, the spokesperson can give out so much hot air. <laughs> um, and so you really need to look at this from a regional perspective because this facility, if this happens, there will be other facilities. The state of New Jersey is looking at a rule to allow for caverns, for storage of, um, of petroleum liquids and other things. You know, we are, you know, when you saw the map, we are the closest area for export from the Marsala Shell region. So you may see this facility and all the trucks and rail cars and problems going through our communities with them because one rail car, you know, one rail car or one truck overturned and you've got a, you know, a nightmare. We should not be playing Russian roulette with our transportation system. And that's what we're going to be doing on a daily basis. But when you look at from a regional impact, the continuation of more and more fracking and drilling and more and more shipping of LNG and pipelines and everything else is going to have a major impact for climate change for this region. It's already seen some of the worst, you know, New Jersey again. Um, and I'm not sure what the Pennsylvania numbers are, but New Jersey itself over the last 50 years has seen a two degree rise in Celsius. We are the second biggest impacted state for temperature rise in the country. And so even though we're on this side of the river, this side of the river is included because we're one environment. I mean, there's not that much difference ecologically between, you know, Gibbstown and Chester. And, you know, we already know that you know the city of Chester has been one of the most overburdened communities in the entire country for toxic pollution and air pollution and everything else. And this will have another layer of direct impact to the health and the safety of the people in this region. Uh, you know, also they have to clean out the tanks. They have to do many other things. There's issues when they load that the chances of spill will go up exponentially. You know, the more they do that. But also, the environmental impacts go up. The more methane that leaks out, the more chance of, you know, oil coming out of a truck, more gasoline, everything else, you know, road salts to keep the roads going. It all adds up. And so when you look at this project from a cumulative impact, it really has uh, tremendous uh, problems. And going back to the, to the site itself, it is one of the most contaminated sites in New Jersey. And it should have been on the Superfund list. But in New Jersey, DuPont has a lot of special favors with a lot of politicians. There's only, they have nine of the worst contaminated sites in New Jersey. Only one of them made Superfund, and that's Hedrickstown. Uh, everyone else somehow never got on the list. And, and that's an important part because when they redevelop that site and how they do it, since it's not to that level of a national priority site, they can get around things. They can cap sites, they can um, not have a full cleanup. And again, you're dealing with a river that floods. So whatever happens on that site by just capping it, and we call it Pave and Wave, has there are more storms, the more flooding, more sea level rise, there's going to be more scouring, more of those toxins are going to be released that way too. So, you know, we see this project as really the wrong project in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong material. You know, instead we should be looking at taking these ports on the Delaware and using them to build our offshore windmills. You know, we worked with, at that time, Senator Sweeney and Governor Christie, we believe, have a windmill port in Fallsboro. 
same thing we should be looking at here because New Jersey is moving to have 7,500 uh, megawatts of offshore wind by 2035, which BOEM, the federal government, by the way, under the Trump administration says that we should have about 12,000 we have the ability out there. And so that would be a better use for this area. Is instead, the, unfortunately, the Paulsboro port is used to import Russian steel for pipelines instead of building the windmills that it was originally supposed to. And I'm going to leave you with one little piece on safety. The Trump administration's Department of Energy says that these facilities should be located in rural areas, that they should be at least a mile away from the nearest town, uh, nearest houses, excuse me, and two miles away from nearest population centers because of the chance of an explosion. This is not the Sierra Club saying this. This was Rick Perry saying that. And so when you look at this facility, being in the middle of such a densely populated area it makes no sense. The only thing denser are the politicians and others who think this is the place it belongs. It doesn't belong. And so, you know, there are tremendous environmental impacts from, from toxics being resuspended, from impacting fisheries, um, you know, tremendous safety impacts, and also that it makes more environmental impacts. And so, you know, again, I just want to end that we are one people, we are one environment, and we are one planet. And this is a kind of facility that does not belong anywhere near here or anywhere anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Next, I'd like to introduce Jocelyn. And I'm going to get Sawyer. And I'm going to get her PowerPoint slide started here. Sorry, I took this as well. I'm not sure that I'll take you. Thank you. Is this a good volume? I'll make sure everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, I would like to talk about the, the climate impacts of this, pro this project and contextualize the Gibstown, Gibstown site excuse me, in just the regional fossil fuel projects and, um, and what this means for the situation that we are in with climate change. Um, I'm Jocelyn Sawyer. I am an organizer in South Jersey with Food and Water Watch and Food and Water Action. We work to fight for uh, food that is safe, that everybody can trust, and affordable, clean water for all, and a livable future and a livable climate, which are, um, I hope, goals that we can all agree on. Um, so just some brief background, where we are right now with climate change. Uh, climate change is the biggest threat right now that is facing our food and our water and our communities. And the science is extremely clear about where, where we are, what needs to be done, what the consequences will be if we don't take bold, decisive action at this point. Um, and so this is a graph here from the International Panel on Climate Change, um, which shows that we already have experienced one degree Celsius of warming since the average global temperatures before the Industrial Revolution. One degree doesn't sound like a whole lot of warming, but um, it is Celsius, not Fahrenheit, and also because of the way that global temperatures are distributed, that means actually a much higher level of warming at the poles and certain other areas of the globe, and significant consequences that, that we're already experiencing, we're already seeing in our climate. Um, droughts and heat waves and fires and just extremities in the weather patterns, extreme weather events uh, like Superstorm Sandy, which was exacerbated by climate change. Um, so we can see at this graph, it's from uh, 2017, we we're already at one degree of warming. We're on a trajectory to get to and exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, warming. And, and uh, what that means is it's a pretty grim picture that we're facing. So in fall of 2018, the, the United Nations International Panel on Climate Change put out a special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. And this report was authored by 91 scientists, uh, even more, I think another additional 100 plus co-authors uh, from 40 countries who reviewed thousands and thousands of studies looking at uh, the climate projections and what actions need to be taken to limit the, the warming. Um, and what this report made so clear was that the amount of warming that we can expect to experience, the difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees, 
fractions of a degree, that will make a huge difference in what kind of future we have and how severe the impacts are on our agricultural patterns and sea level rise and our, our aquifers, our water systems, the extreme temperatures, the extreme weather patterns. And this report uh, concluded that to have the best chance of avoiding the most chaotic, catastrophic effects of climate change, we have to keep warming to under 1.5 degrees Celsius. And what that means for us lay people is we need to dramatically cut our greenhouse gas emissions very fast, stop spewing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and we need to see a 45% emissions reduction from 2010 levels in the next 10 years by 2030. And, uh, and we really need to get to net zero, so where we're not putting out more than is being captured and taken in by 2050. But that 10-year mark at 2030 is incredibly important. And if we don't meet that goal, that, that goal that's coming up very quickly, uh, we could really, we could start to see a really a severe snowball effect of just things spiraling out of control with runaway climate change. And so I know that that information is probably reviewed to some, but just wanted to make that very clear. Um, and unfortunately, the uh, natural gas industry has no plans of curbing emissions. This is actually out of date at this point, but these are some of, <laughs> not all, of the new gas infrastructure projects that are moving forward or uh, planned or been recently finished in the state of New Jersey. Um, so not even counting Pennsylvania, this is just New Jersey. These are new gas pipelines or compressor stations or power plants uh, that are being constructed and that you know, the, the industry imagines will have a lifetime of several decades and still be operating way past that important uh, checkpoint of 2030 where we need to be dramatically reducing our emissions. And so these are some things that might have heard about natural gas, um, that it is actually a better option for the climate than coal, or that it's a bridge fuel that will help us transition to cleaner energy, um, or even this idea that we actually need to build natural gas infrastructure to meet our energy needs. Um, but these are all messages that have been put forward by the industry whose real motive is profit and is putting profit um, over our communities and over our health and our climate. Uh, Food and Water Watch recently came out with a number of new reports that pulled together a lot of research about fracking and natural gas um, and have have reviewed a lot of studies and a lot of research to show that actually these, these things are not true. And the reality is that gas is just as bad for the climate as coal, especially in the short term, as Jeff had mentioned. Methane is 80, 85, 86 times as potent as carbon dioxide in the short term. And that short term window is so critical. That's what we're looking at. Um, and so much methane actually leaches into the atmosphere in every stage of, from fracking to, to transportation, um, every stage of the process that any kind of climate benefits that gas would have had are negated by just how much greenhouse gas is pouring into the atmosphere even before we burn the gas. Um, and the truth is that we already have reliable clean energy technology that, that we need to power our homes and communities. Um, fracking and especially the Skidstown site, which is an export terminal, is not about energy security or keeping energy costs low. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's that we actually have a glut of domestic gas. It's so cheap that the industry can't profit off of it. And that's why they're turning to exports in order to keep those prices high enough that they can profit. Um, they don't want our energy to be so cheap. Um, and in addition to that, a lot of gas that is being exported, especially from the Marcella Shale, is intended for plastics manufacturing, um, which is kind of the next big profitable horizon for the gas industry. Um, is not is not energy, it's plastics, because plastics are made from fossil fuels. Um, this is just a, yeah, a graphic from one of the new reports that I mentioned um, on the climate impacts of gas and just ways that gas can leak at each of these stages of production. Um, and yeah, so what, what we're really facing is it just beyond even the local impacts um, this is a much bigger picture of which the Skidstown facility is only one piece of the puzzle and the industry trying to cement, lock us into natural gas production for decades into the future, including making this region a, a gas hub for exports. Um, and so this is not just about this site and it's not just about the, the local environmental impacts and the, the very important points that have already been brought up. 
it's part of the wider movement and the wider crisis that we're facing with our climate. And so that piece needs to be considered too. Um, yeah, we're doing that. Thank you. So Alex Baumstein from Clean Air Council was going to be speaking about natural gas liquids, um, but he could he was so ill he couldn't even get out of bed this morning. So he apologizes, um, and we'll try to cover that as well as we can during the questions and answers if anybody has questions about the natural gas liquids portion of this, uh, this project. So right now we'd like to bring up our featured speaker. Um, he was delayed getting here. <laughs> because of the storm, Amtrak took their time leaving Washington, D.C., or Alexandria, Virginia. So um, it took him a little bit to get here, but he's here. And um, his name is Fred Millar, and he's worked for decades as a public interest and environmental safety advocate. He's a national policy analyst and a lobbyist, and he's a consultant, and he's based in the Washington, D.C. area. He's provided analysis on industrial chemical risks and alternatives, transportation risks, also accident prevention, emergency planning, and homeland security. First as a staff member of the Environmental Policy Institute, and then later at Friends of the Earth, and more recently as a consultant to a major US chemical and oil worker unions and governmental bodies and nonprofits. Um, he now is a consultant, and we're lucky to have him here. He's testified in Congress and in major city and county council hearings. He's a great guy to answer our questions today. And he's going to explain just what liquefied natural gas is and what its potential and risks are. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I I'm a, I'm a, have a southern accent, so I hope that's OK. Uh, I also just want to warn people that um, virtually all the information that, that I had to share with you today about LNG should be a secret because, you know, there's all these terrorists out there. And, uh, and so the government keeps a lot of this stuff very secret. We, and, and in fact, one of the major developments recently is that the government has actually concluded that, or conceded, I should say, that uh, an LNG cloud can go out from a facility a quite far distance into your community. And then, if it's unignited, find a source of confinement, like in a ditch or between two houses or, or, or up against a row of trees, and then just spontaneously explode. Now, that's called confined vapor cloud explosion. But you haven't heard about that. And in fact, the government says, we can see this can happen but it's difficult to calculate this, and we won't do it about how far the cloud goes. So that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a very secretive kind of set of folks who don't want you to know the basic, the basic risks and, and, the, and the, all, the, all the kinds of risks that can you, you, encounter in, you encounter in your community. Um, so let me see what I'm going to just move this along here. One thing to note is that um, LNG is now more important out in the world than it has been up to now, and, um, and the United States is, is cashing in on that. The United States has now become the biggest exporter of all the other nations to Europe. So I just want you to know that that's part of what the pressure is on your area, is that you know, your, your coastline here on the East Coast is the closest to Europe, as was said earlier, and so you should expect that you're sort of in the, in the bowling alley for a whole lot of stuff that's going I mean, we, are, we have overtaken all these other countries in terms of, uh, in terms of exports to, to, uh, to Europe. Um, one thing that all, all communities want to know is how far, can, how far is safe enough? How far can you have a, uh, a, an LNG release that can cause what kinds of impacts? So people do all kinds of calculations and, and, try to, and try to use very kinds of, of sophisticated calculations. This is a probabilistic kind of calculation, which really uh, doesn't tell you how far the cloud can go in terms of the consequence. It just says, well, the probability that this will happen is so far out to here and so far out to there. You should, you should know right away that probability calculations are designed to obscure the truth of distances and, and consequence calculations. 
I mean, what we should be, be demanding is worst case scenarios in terms of distances of what kinds of impacts can occur in our communities. The protective distances that are needed are, are, often, um, are often hard to figure out, but um, what, the, what the federal government do, does is, 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 correct, uh, is, is construct a, a bunch of calculations about how we can design a plant that will keep the, keep the LNG, keep, keep the emissions of, of a release, keep the LNG release within a certain facility. Now, they use very sophisticated calculations about this, and then they negotiate with the facility proponents for about a year and then, they, and, then, and then they decide how to build this plant to meet the federal calculations. I want you to know right away, those federal calculations are about, not about worst case scenarios. They're about, quote, a credible release, a small release, a smaller release of LNG on the, on the facility site. And so they're basically negotiating with the uh, plant designers on how they can meet the federal regulations. And it's all very quiet behind the scenes calculations that you're not in on. So that, that's, a, that's just another side of the whole situation. There's a small scale facility operating right now, for example, in Miami, in, in, in the middle of the Hialeah rail yard. The New Fortress Energy uh, small scale facility is operating there. They're trying to cram these facilities into smaller and smaller spaces. And um, guess, you, know, you should ask, well, what federal agency has approved the siting of this facility? Not one. No federal agency has approved the siting of this facility because uh, FERC has just said we're not going to do it and, and uh, the FEMSA people um, have said, well, we'll look at the calculations, but we don't approve siting. So a lot of this stuff is getting unregulated and there's a growth of smaller scale facilities around the country. You've already seen some of the pictures of super tankers that are being used. This is the kind of ship that would be calling in at your facility um, at Gibbstown once it gets going. And, and so people, uh, citizens are kind of left on their own devices. They try to calculate various kinds of things about what are the worst case scenarios, but they just have to grasp for various kinds of methodologies and, and, uh, and, and try to come up with some kind of an answer that they can use. It's a very, it's very um, a catch as catch can. And, um, and the government is not helping us out on that. Um, you know, we've had a, we've had a similar, I, I think you've already heard that the Gibbstown facility that, you, that you're facing here is an unprecedented situation. It's a new experiment in the way they're doing this with bringing in trains and trucks and then trying to transload those into ships, planning to do that. Now that's unprecedented. So we've had already in this country an unprecedented experiment with, uh, with petrochemical and, 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 and flammable chemical risk. It was called the crude oil trains debacle, starting in around 2006, when the, when the railroad industry just said, and the, and the oil industry said, we'll just throw uh, crude oil out onto the railroad tracks in 100 car long unit trains, and, and we'll let them move at speed through the countryside, and we won't be doing, and, and, and it, 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 they just put it out there in a, in a very abrupt fashion. In fact, the Secretary of Transportation, Anthony Fox, said on television at one point, you know, we really weren't ready for this. And so what happened was predictable enough. We had a, a, set, of a, we had a set of disasters that was really terrible, including the one in Lac Magante, Quebec. Now, you, I mentioned earlier, you have ports on the East Coast that are, are, in the, are, are in the sort of firing line for a huge amount of, of export of crude oil and, and LNG to go to other places in the world, and including to Europe and maybe even to Asia. But you're closest to Europe, so that would probably be the one. This is the port of Albany in terms of the kinds of trains lined up to put crude oil into, into uh, tankers on the way uh, to export. Lac Megantic was the iconic disaster in the crude oil days. Again, well, we had an unprecedented experiment going on, and, the, and it didn't work very well. Um, these, these unit trains are very long, long trains and hard to handle. Whether they're LNG or crude oil, they're very hard to handle. And they were blowing up, and, and, and just one train blew up in the middle of the night in Lac Megantic, Quebec, and killed 47 people. So that's kind of the iconic. But, but we had 15 or 20 other major accidents with ethanol, and, 
and crude oil unit trains. And so basically the federal government came in and finally did some regulations. They designed a new tank car for uh, crude oil, for example. Um, but even that tank car has continued to release. It's only marginally safer. I mean, this industry is on a roll and the federal government is only marginally regulating any kind of new safety devices. That, now you can say, similar kinds of accidents can happen with, with uh, uh, other kinds of chemicals besides crude oil. This is propane. This is LPG. This is a, a set of rail cars in, Crest, in uh, Crescent City, Illinois, that blew up and, um, and, and put out a fireball like that. That is what we are facing in terms of, of, of multi-car <coughs> derailments of, uh, of the other kinds of cargoes that could come into Gibbstown, not just, uh, not just in, uh, the LNG. LNG goes around the countryside in, in, in trucks that are you know, nice and shiny, and, and they've been going to remote areas around the United States for many years, and they haven't had a disaster yet. They've had a few kinds of accidents, but they haven't had, but it's not been a very big part of the, of the, of the, of the U.S. energy picture. It's just been a very small part. And so when the federal government says, oh, we've got years and years of experience transporting LNG around the country in trucks, they've got years all right, but a very tiny sample. It mostly goes to areas, to small or remote areas that are unserved by pipelines, like m uh, mining operations and greenhouse operations that are nowhere near a pipeline, and they need some kind of natural gas for heating of one thing or another. So the truck LNG flows in the country, however. Now, this is, a, this is an estimate of what the, what the truck energy, uh, truck load uh, of, of LNG uh, patterns go around the country. You'll see that your area gets a, a substantial flow of LNG trucks already coming through this area. So, the, you know, the, and what I'm saying again is that they go mostly to areas that are underserved, like some of yours may well be going to New England, places where the pipelines don't reach very well. Uh, the industry is, you won't be surprised to hear, um, the industry is, um, let, me, let me go back one. The industry is keen on misleading people about the, the risks of LNG, and so they have videos where they show uh, a, a guy standing in front of an audience and drinking LNG. Okay, um, now you can do, I mean, liquid LNG, it's true, liquid LNG does not burn and it does not explode, um, but the liquid LNG is so cold that it picks up heat from wherever it is, whether it's the land or the water, and then it forms a huge vapor cloud, 600 times, times bigger than the container, 620 times bigger than the tank car or the tank truck, and that cold, dense cloud is what moves, can move into your community and either ignite or be confined and blow up. So, but industry trots these people around and says, see, you can practically drink LNG. There's, there's, a, there's a video with some very beautiful young people who's, who, who's, uh, whose title is, uh, what's so cool about LNG? Everything is so cool about LNG. And so I, I recommend the video if you want to get really impressed with how slick and how, it, and how determined this industry is to try to convince people that LNG is a safe thing. Um, in fact, one of, the, one of the key lines that LNG likes to use with people is, in the unlikely case of a spill, LNG will vaporize and then arise and dissipate. I mean, it's like going up to heaven, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm glad to believe in heaven, right? Going up to heaven. It's like, it's not going to hurt you, folks. Well, that, that depends, right? I mean, if, if, if there's no ignition source and there's no confinement, okay, it'll eventually dissipate, but that's not a very good bet. And, and if you have a railroad spill or a truck spill in a crowded community in, 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 in the Philadelphia area or in New Jersey, you're not going to bet that it's not going to find any source of ignition and it's not going to find any source of confinement. You just can't afford to bet that. The federal government has done a little bit of research on, on what could happen in terms of uh, an, an LNG spill over water. And, but, but they haven't done anything on land. Now we do have some examples of LNG accidents on land, and in Spain we've had two trucks that levied, meaning a, a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion where the truck just blows apart after being in a sustained fire for a while, it just blows apart. So we've had two of those uh, that, in Spain, and the scientists used to say, oh, LNG is not likely to blevy, but now we know in fact that it can. 
This is, this is the, uh, sorry, this is the overland uh, LNG fire that was produced by releasing about one truckload of LNG, again, in a, in a, over water, in a, in a desert experiment. What the, what the finding was, basically, is that you get a really high, hot fire. You get a really high, hot fire, and you can't put it out. There's no way to put out an LNG fire. And um, basically, it's, it, there's a lot of uncertainties in, 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 in all the calculations here. They're just trying to do the most basic kind of behavior research on how does an LNG release uh, behave. And it's way behind, but, well, in, in part because it's really expensive to do field testing. Now, now they, I'm very worried that one set of people that are really getting misled by this industry are emergency responders. Uh, the emergency response community is being told, and, and I've seen the written training materials that the federal government actually funded uh, that, go, that go out to the emergency responders, and, and they have two main themes is you can manage an LNG release using your, you know, I mean, as if, you, as if the same kind of techniques you might use for offensive firefighting or whatever you could use for an LNG release. And so, and so you see they, they put out pictures, pretty pictures, of firefighters, quote, approaching an LNG situation. I mean, that is really, really misleading. Um, the second thing they say, and see, it's, this is even worse. Um, I mean, when I say it's misleading, uh, I, I, talked to, I talked to one of the firefighters in, in Florida, um, one of the guys who, who's on, a, on, a, on the east coast of Florida, and uh, he's faced with an LNG uh, loading situation there uh, from, that, from that Hialeah uh, facility I mentioned. And, um, and, and, he, and he, I asked him, how's the training that you've gotten? He said, well, we, we, we took the industry training, the railroad provided training uh, on LNG risk. He said, uh, we just laughed at it. He said, I'm not doing any of that stuff. You know, I'm not going to try this offensive firefighting in an LNG situation. I'm not doing any of that stuff. I mean, he, he didn't know me from Adam, but he just volunteered. This is not credible, and it's really dangerous, and, and I don't want to hear about it. it it's dangerous for the it's for emergency responders, but it's also dangerous, of course, for the community that they're supposed to protect if they are misled about what they can actually do. In fact, uh, when you look at the when you look at the most recent LNG kinds of studies from the from the federal government, what they say they they sort of default to the Orange Book, you know, the Emergency Response Guidebook. I'll mention that in a minute. This is the best picture that, that, that I like activists to have in their heads about an LNG release because this picture shows the release of LNG in an, in an enclosed environment. I mean, the, actually, the flow of LNG goes from, from right to left here. Um, it, there's an enclosure, and the LNG is released in an enclosure, and those are called vapor barriers. And the industry had hoped that putting vapor barriers around an LNG facility would help protect the community and, and give the community more time to run away or, or whatever, right? And so they let some loose in this, it's called a Falcon test, the test that was done in 1987. They released it and they had a 30 foot high barrier all around the whole site. Well, you see what happened was the cloud that comes out is so enormous that it overtops the barrier and goes downwind pretty far actually. Now they only, they didn't know this was gonna happen. So they put monitors out not only as far as 250 meters, um, but the but fact that it went way past those monitors all down, down into the desert, and we don't even have a measurement about how far it went. You know, so basically, but this is the picture people need to hear. Does this look like it's going up to heaven to you? You know? The Orange Book is the, is the Bible that emergency responders have around the country. It's, it's the USDOT Emergency Response Guidebook. And what it says is, and the federal government now says, okay, look at the Orange Book. What the Orange Book says, and I'm not expecting you to be able to read this, is that if there's an LNG rail car or truck that's involved in a fire, if, it is, if, there's, if it's involved in a fire, evacuate one mile as your initial evacuation. Your initial evacuation is a mile. Then think about what to do after that. There was a fire chief in, a, our most recent LNG accident happened in Plymouth, Washington. And the local fire chief, which had an LNG facility in his county, didn't know anything about LNG. So he called the next county and talked to Lonnie Click over there and, and said, Lonnie, you know something about hazmat. Will you come and be the incident commander at this site? We've got fires and explosions at the LNG facility. So Lonnie Click says to this big audience in Washington, D.C., he said, I didn't know anything about LNG. I got my LNG training 101 
as I was driving a half an hour to the facility. Yes, I was driving. And he said, basically he's looking at the orange book and so forth. And he said, once I got there and I saw there were fires and explosions, I, I evacuated, I, I, and I saw that the orange book said evacuate one mile. I evacuated two miles. I evacuated a radius of two miles around an LNG incident in a, in a relatively rural area. Now, just try to extrapolate that to evacuating two miles um, in, in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, a, a major city. It's just, it, it's just, it would be incredible challenge, right? The, um, there, there's a few experiments going on with LNG fuel locomotives around the country that, that are not really important to know very much about. I want you to see what the trucks and the rail cars look like. These are just the major vehicles that are now being used. The trucks are about 10,000 gallons and the rail cars are about 30,000 gallons uh, each. Um, the, there's also ISO containers, intermodal containers that can be used to transport LNG. Every flat car, every rail car can carry two of these. And um, there's some of that going on now in Florida in a very regional experiment and up in Alaska. Um, if, if, um, there's a thing called bunkering LNG, meaning how do you refuel a ship that uses LNG? So the tote ships uh, that carry freight, uh, the tote company has ships that carry freight, they bunker, their, they, they, they refuel their LNG uh, engines in their ships by bringing LNG trucks up to the dock and unloading LNG into the fuel storage tank of that bunker ship. Now, it's not the same as filling up a giant cargo ship that's going to carry LNG. They're just filling up the storage tank for LNG on this on this uh, on this boat on this ship and 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 I'll finally just finish with this because this is kind of outstanding recklessness on the part of the industry the industry this is a this is a, a schematic of what would happen of what's called simultaneous operations meaning um, if we're going to have cruise ships going into Florida ports that are if the fuel ships themselves are I mean I'm sorry if we have cruise ships going into Florida ports if they are fueled by LNG then that means when we get to these Florida ports, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, we're going to have to refuel with LNG as we get there. And, what we, and, and, and the, the cruise industry is going to Florida ports, and this is what the Coast Guard says, and they are basically bullying the Florida ports by saying, we want to be able to conduct simultaneous operations. Now, as cruise ships, we make money by loading and unloading, say, 7,000 passengers into a ship loading and unloading 7,000 passengers into a ship. So that's a lot of time. And if we have to, if we, if we have to wait and until you finish refueling with your LNG truck, that's going to cost us money. So we want to do SIMOPS, simultaneous operations means we want to be able to, to put refueling with LNG at the same times as we're loading passengers onto this. Now, when I talked to people at the National Passenger Association about this, they had never heard about this problem. But they did say to me, well, you know, we tend to think of passengers as like the most risky kinds of folks in the whole maritime environment. I mean, passengers have cell phones and they have, and they have cigarette lighters and they have, you know, you know they, I mean, basically, you, you, they just kind of do things. I mean, and, and you, you don't trust them to be well-trained and careful, right? So in any case, this is just one final example of how reckless this industry is getting to be. If you know anybody that, I mean, this is maybe the future of the, of the cruise industry, is that they're going to be finding that passengers are loading onto these giant cruise ships that have carry 7,000 passengers simultaneously to uh, LNG refueling operations. So I'll finish with that and just, uh, uh, I, I appreciate having a chance to talk with you about it and, and uh, I'm really glad that you guys are working on this uh, issue here. We all have to be working on looking at LNG as a really dangerous new way for the petrochemical industry to make a lot of money by, because you know, if you leave the natural gas in the ground, the industry calls out a stranded asset, meaning it's not making us any money. So we've got to pull it out of the ground and get it somewhere. Well, let's put it in. Let's let's make it. Let's put it into LNG because then we can ship it to the big markets of Europe and Asia. And you guys just happen to be in between us, the, the major market of Europe and where most of the LNG is being produced uh, in this in, in North America. So it's a, you know, you have a stake in this. Thanks a lot. And we're going to throw it open. Maybe our panelists uh, can come up. Fred, you've been standing all this time. <laughs> um, 
before we, bring it to the chair. So we, we'd like folks to be uh, to feel free to ask questions you can either ask them of an individual or generally um, and I'd also while we're doing this like to pass out um, this is the likely railroad route um, from Wyderson Township in Bradford County um, to Gibbstown that has been approved under the <coughs> permit I would just like to say that that liquefaction plant up there is another piece in the chain of damage that's done through the development of natural gas uh, being brought down to Gibbstown and exported overseas. So you can see where we can expect these trains to go. We also have, and I think I skipped over it, a slide if anyone is interested of what we think to be the most likely truck route. So, um, so does anyone have any questions? Yes. We don't, um, I don't know that we have a, if you could just stand up and kind of speak up that way we can hear. I don't know that that's even happening yet. Are how many ships already powered no, by LNG? There are, there, are some, there are some ships now that are being powered by LNG. I would say it's maybe 30 in the world so far, but 30 or 50 more are being built. LNG is uh, valued by the shipping industry because they have a new international uh, regulation coming uh, this year that tells the ship owners, you have to change away from your dirty fuel that you've been using, bunker, bunker fuel and dirty diesel fuel in your ships. You have to have less emissions from your ships so a lot of major ship companies are saying, well, we should switch to LNG because that has less emissions. So there, there are ships that are being built right now, a lot of ships being built with LNG as a fuel. Though in LA, uh, in the port of LA, they're doing compressed natural gas electric. Uh, they're running generators. It's a little, a little safer, but that's one of the things that they're looking at there in LA anyway, to lower emissions from ships. Right. We certainly wouldn't support the use of natural gas to power ships. We need to make a leap to renewable and sustainable energy sources. Um, yes, in the back. I was a little unclear about the actual process of getting the liquefied natural gas into the ships for export. Can you just explain that? Well, I can start. Um, not, not if you saw his, if you saw his uh, slide about the, the boat uh, with, the, with the trucks, yes. with the hoses, that's pretty much how that worked. Well, and he, yeah. said, he said, I thought that that was just for when Fueling. I, yeah, that was for those ships. Just when he was fueling, I, think, I thought he was were implying that, that when he was actually for exporting a much larger volume, that it was done in a different way. But maybe I No, I'll tell you. Pardon? Oh, okay. We explained that earlier. That's okay. But let me just say. Can you want to maybe repeat the question into the mic? So the question is, how does the LNG that's going to be brought down to Gibbstown get into the ships? So one of the problems with this uh, proposal uh, for the Dock 2 is that the liquefied natural gas will be bought, uh, brought by trucks and or by rail to the Gibbstown site from Pennsylvania. And because the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission would have to give approval for uh, the, use, the export of LNG if there were pipelines coming into the site or if there were storage of liquefied natural gas at the site. In order, because that would be required, the company has decided instead to directly load from the trucks and or rail cars to the ships by basically a pipe that sort of looks like that picture. So there is a 20 truck, uh, 20 rail car rack that's being built for Dock 1, originally just to move liquefied uh, hazardous gases or natural gas liquids. And that 20 car rack would be used, the, the rail cars would come up, those pipes there would load it directly into the <coughs> ship. And the same thing is being planned using probably a different configuration, but similar to that rail uh, car rack for Dock 2. And there would be two berths with two ships that I had the picture up earlier. And those would take 15 days, 10 to 15 days, to fill one ship from these rail cars. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
365 days a year, a perpetual transloading would be going on in order to get the ships filled and down the river in order for them to actually generate the amount of gas that they say they want to generate to make money at the site. So, or at least 2,600 trucks for one ship, so think of it that way. Yeah, if they use the trucks, there's also a truck rack, and those trucks also would be unloading. And right now, well, 10, 12,000 gallons per truck, in order to fill up those, you know, that, those uh, ships, it still would take 10 to 15 days. Um, but, you know, thousands of trucks, basically. Crazy. Yeah. yeah, right here in the front. Thank you, Scott, for getting that working. As a non-scientist, how do they keep it cold enough in a train truck, I mean a train car or a truck, with all the time? What, how thick is the wall? How cold can they make it? Could you talk in here? Fred will answer that. that. Right here. That one doesn't work. Oh, no, okay. Um, well, um, it, it's very difficult to keep it cold. In fact, they can't keep it completely cold. Uh, it's, they just have very well insulated trucks and very well insulated rail cars, but uh, they also lose a certain amount. I mean, they, they cannot keep it cold enough so that there's no evaporation even in those kinds of insulated cars. So they have to have various kinds of valves that release the pressure um, that, that from the evaporation. And they just try to make it so that they get to where they're going quickly enough so there's no serious loss of the contents, of course, this is you know this is money if they're losing LNG. So so they you know through this vaporizing, so they basically try to try their best to get there in a relatively short period of time. Yeah. One interesting thing to say about this to notice is that is that this looks to me like it's only a one pipeline at a time system, one truck at a time, one pipeline at a time. When we said that this this other uh, proposed thing at, at Gipstown is, is a very different thing, it looks like they're going to have 24. Uh, rail cars are 24 trucks lined up, all unloading at one time mm -hmm. into a huge system of getting of piping over to the ship. Right. Now, now basically that's unprecedented, and um, you know anytime you have an unprecedented set of operations, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong, including human error and human accidents, failure of equipment, and we can't forget about the potentials for terrorism. I mean, when let me just mention about terrorism. Philadelphia was a, was a, was no, notorious for a while in the in the terrorism community, anti-terrorism community, because when the main U.S. Coast Guard expert Stephen Flynn wrote a book called America the Vulnerable, he was looking for what is a worst-case scenario for a terrorist release in the United States, and he picked Philadelphia, and he picked a refinery that you have in Philadelphia that was using hydrogen fluoride, very dangerous toxic gas, and he said he postulated that a terrorist group, just a small terrorist group, could release the, t the hydrogen fluoride from the, from the refinery in Philadelphia, and he predicted that the cloud would drift over a Philly Stadium and o other parts of Philadelphia and be a huge urban disaster. So all I'm trying to say is that, is that uh, the Philadelphia was, has, has already been chosen as a place where you could have something like that. Um, given that, given that Gibbstown is in the Philadelphia hazardous, uh, you know, you, the thing called urban hazardous, um, uh, er, high, high threat urban areas, con, uh, con, zone of concern, and Gibbstown is certainly within that zone of concern in the Philadelphia area. Hi, I, I have a three-part question. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I'm on the Environmental Commission for uh, Township Area here in West Texas. Uh, and I wanted to get more information for them. Uh, I don't know what we can do about this. Uh, and then I was interested in a more detailed railroad map <laughs> around South Jersey. <laughs> and also, I have friends who work in the real estate industry down here, and I would think that all of this kind of information would be something they would want to know about and find. Well, thank you for coming. And uh, you know, one of our uh, we can talk a little more after questions and answers. But one of our uh, reasons for coming here today is to engage people. And um, we are we have a lot of different thoughts about actions that can be done by municipalities, such as resolutions being passed, um, perhaps a small forum in your 
community. Um, we'll go to living rooms to talk to people about this. Or so, River Winds. Or over at River we've, Winds. We've done stuff there before. We have. We had a forum at River Winds. So, uh, you know, in, in, know right that. on the river there. So, um, you know, we're, we're open and we, uh, in New Jersey, we have the Empower New Jersey Coalition, which is committed to stopping this. In Pennsylvania, um, really, it's growing, the interest, because the more people find out about it, the more people become concerned. So we really would like to work with you. Um, and I think also just, you know, just in terms of um, being active, uh, we're really at the start of this. This is not a done deal. They've received two permits. My organization is appealing both of them. So we're in court fighting them. We believe they made fatal errors in the way they issued those permits. And the National Environmental Policy Process, uh, 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 administra um, Nat National Environmental Policy Act uh, process has not even begun yet, and that would be uh, led by the Army Corps of Engineers. So there's a lot that needs to happen before this is approved. I just want to add. I, I just want to add that there's a lot of pressure needs to be put on Governor Murphy. He says he's for clean energy. He says he's for renewables. He says he's concerned about pipelines. Well, the DEP has a lot of say on not only on permits here, something called the Toxic Catastrophe Prevention Act, which is a New Jersey bill fall law, that any facility that could endanger the lives of up to 100,000 people or greater, uh, the state has to do a very careful review. And so there are a lot of pressure points that groups and people can do. And to me, that's you know, one of those areas, especially the DEP and our governor. Yeah, so one of my colleagues here needs to that this is Pardon? No. Well, that's what, that, well, you have to understand, you know, I've been doing this, you know, since I was the first Earth Day 50 years ago, and you know how many times I've been told it was a dumb deal? You know, I mean, that's what they always say, because this way you give up, you don't fight, and I've been told so many times if something's a dumb deal that, you know what, if, if the people come out and the people stand up and you, and you stick to your principles and you have strong goals, you usually win. That's why the metal in, I mean, that's why the Pinelands is not a giant jet port. You go down the list of everything that was a dumb deal that's not a yeah. dumb deal. That's actually, I was like, who can the commission contact? I can't hear the commission. Who should the commission contact? Oh, oh. Uh, on the sheet that we handed out, there's contact information. If you, Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, and, and then also the governor and us. And Empower New Jersey, which is a Empower. And then Empower New Jersey, which is a coalition of 92 uh, groups from faith and labor to environmental and community organizations. Yeah, New Pennsylvania does not have any say except through the federal permits, Army Corps of Engineers, and yet you're going to be impacted by this. So, what? So, you know, the idea is that we need to stop it in New Jersey, but we need to have really muscle and um, the participation of people from a, the entire region. So they realize this isn't just a little project in New Jersey or a massive project in New Jersey. This is a Delaware River watershed, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey issue because it's going to impact all those areas. It's not fair that you're sitting here in Chester and don't have any say over this. When the Army Corps of Engineering process starts, you will have the ability to participate. And we will, that's why the sign-in sheets are so important because we will let you know every step of the way as the opportunity arises for people to participate. And we're pushing all the time for more and more ways for people to participate. If anyone else wants copies of the permits that are needed, I have them here. Uh, Fred, did you want to add? You know, I just, I have just two encouraging points to make. Um, one is that, it, 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 which is kind of like an influence uh, multiplier, if you look at it. One, one point to make historically is that, you know, the LNG industry tried to locate an enormous number of about 60 LNG plants up and down the East Coast and the West Coast at one time in, 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 US history, in recent U.S. history, import plants when mm -hmm. we were going to import. They, the people on the East Coast and the West Coast rose up and fought like heck, and they almost got none of those authorized and built. So, that kind of opposition has worked in the past, and now this is the this is the export era for EPA. I'm, I'm sorry, LNG, where they're building export facilities in. But they but the the industry had to decide 
you know, if we're going to build any big new LNG facilities, we better put them all in a friendly place like Texas and Louisiana. Not on the East Coast, not on the West Coast. Well, there's one on the East Coast, namely Cove Point, but not, no major facilities on the East Coast and the West Coast. They, they, they have fled, in effect, to the friendly territory of Louisiana and Texas. But the second thing to mention is that, you know, the LNG market around the world, the natural gas market around the world, is very up and down and very dubious and very sketchy. And so lots of facilities propose something and then they back off because of the, the, the market uh, variety variations is so, are so great. Whatever you do here to stand up and make this controversial, that's going to get to some investors who are going to say, do I really want to invest my money in something as risky as this, as LNG, when it might not even pan out in the long run? This is an, this is an influence multiplier. Whatever you do here, will have it'll get to some risk averse investors at some point. And, they'll, and, and some of them will back off. And I just would add that the governor in uh, uh, Washington State turned, uh, excuse me, in Oregon turned down the permits for the uh, Jordan Cove LNG export terminal. Just happened. I wanted to thank you for um, we can't, uh, That's not really working, yeah. So, no, it shuts off easily. you got to keep pushing the button up. Thank you. I can speak loudly. I'm a teacher. <laughs> so thank you for everything that you've shared with us. I think we all have a lot of concerns after listening to you. We probably came in with some. I, I would just encourage you to find a, a central place to have this information. So I'm picking up stuff with big water action from Delaware River. You know, and it's it's kind of overwhelming. I'm here representing the Church of Green Stewards in, in, in uh, the Westchester area. So if you could find a way to collaborate um, to share information so we could go to a source that we could then post on Facebook and other social media and share out. It's much easier than having pieces all over. And I know you've given us some contact information and people to pressure, but it's really helpful if a week to 10 days ahead of time, at least, somebody says, go do this and call this person pronto. Um, so that's the way I operate, is somebody's got to be in my face because it's kind of overwhelming with all this detail. Sure. Uh, certainly, and we've already done that for New Jersey organizations, and Power New Jersey is a coalition of organizations, almost 100 now, and we've committed ourselves and share information through the Empower New Jersey website and Facebook page. So we already do that now in New Jersey. We're just starting here in Pennsylvania, and um, we, you know, we, that uh, link for information that's at the bottom of these sheets has a very good web page, that's the Delaware Riverkeeper Network web page. So right away, you can go on there, you'll see a history, dozens of important um, documents. You can really get educated by looking at that. But through the Empower New Jersey website and Facebook page, you'll be able to find out about opportunities for action. Just like you're saying, enough ahead that you can plan to go. Uh, this forum was actually you know, advertised for Gosh, what was it, Scott? Six weeks ahead, we started advertising in all of the community uh, newspapers around here. And, and I think you know one of the important things is that everywhere we go and have a forum like this, we're growing the people who learn about it. And we will continue to use um, the, the Empower New Jersey website as a portal that then has other links to more information. And then also anybody here who wants to get involved to the point where you want to be involved at, at hosting perhaps an organization, hosting some of this information. We're happy to talk about that with you too. Yes. yes. So I apologize, my battery died. Oh. <laughs> How long would, would it likely be for the remaining um, permit to be issued if they... How long for the remaining permit, permits? Well, there's one permit that should, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, that should be coming out basically any day now. And that is a review by the Army Corps based on a public notice that was issued a few months ago. The comment period has already expired. A lot of people and a lot of experts put comments on the record. And what basically the message was is they need to do an environmental impact statement, a full, cumulative, comprehensive environmental analysis of the potential uh, impacts of this project before they would do anything else. NEPA, that National Environmental Policy Act process, is not an approval, it's a process. But it's a way that people can weigh in and more information can get on the record, arguments can be made, and just disclosure of what the real risks are um, can be put on the record and must be considered. So that is expected any day now. If they come out and say there's a finding of no 
uh, significance, or perhaps they're going to say we're going to do an environmental assessment. We want a full environmental impact statement, but that process will be very involving and should come out any day. We don't know what the length of time would be. It usually takes about a year to go through that process. Um, in order for the um, project to get its approval from other places, such as the U.S. Coast Guard, um, it's really a letter of recommendation. It's, again, it's not really a permit, but that letter of recommendation is ex expected any day now, too. They put that for only Dock 1. Dock 1, remember, that secret letter that I told you about that was filed by Delaware River Partners without letting anybody know, and many of the agencies didn't even know, saying they wanted to move liquefied natural gas when they were saying to the public and the local community, it's not going to be liquefied natural gas. That secret letter was dated September 2017. The Army Corps, I mean, the uh, U.S. Coast Guard has taken to this date to review that letter. And any day now, they should be coming out with their decision about whether they feel there's enough room or space or opportunity on the river for Dock 1 to move ships up and down the river. Now remember, we're talking about tripling the activity at the site because the second dock with two berths triples one dock with one berth. Whether or not they can do that is totally up in the air. And the last time we filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the U.S. Coast Guard, they said they hadn't even received that application yet. That was a few weeks ago. So that process took them over two years for Dock 1. I don't know how long it would take for Dock 2, but you get the idea. Um, there are other New Jersey permits that are needed. They have recently gotten some of those, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but really, we're, we're a way, in terms of liquefied natural gas coming into Gibbstown, it's going to take at least a year and a half or two years because they have not built the liquefaction plant in Wiley's and Township, Bradford County yet. So that, that's permitted, but it's, they, that's not built yet. They started clearing land. That they say that's going to take a, at least a year and a half, two years to build. So the process that they need to go through in terms of permits and then getting their ducks in the line to actually do this at Dock 2 is probably a year or two. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can relax, because as these, pro these permits come out, we need to fight every single one of them. And we need to participate in the process to put information on the record that's compelling about the dangers of the, of the proposal in order to be able to stop the trajectory of having a grease track, basically. Oh, okay, we have a few. All right, well, can we go with Ed first? Yeah. Go ahead, Ed. Uh, question, couple questions. I have the railroad map. I, I, I'm trying to, where do the railroad tracks go across the Delaware River? Are the tracks already there? Or are they going to yeah, 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 yeah. The tracks already there. They're probably going to use the Delaware Bridge. Right. It goes from Philadelphia across. It comes over and depends yeah. off. Or they may use the, um, the, the West Trenton Bridge as another on rail bridge. They used the West Trenton Bridge in the past for uh, crude oil. So they could uh, use that one as well. Far away from where it is. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay, the next question I have is, I assume that for all of these railroad cars and or trucks, they're going to need enormous yards right at the plant to be bringing them in and out all the time. Is that uh, on Fred, the map that, uh, that we've looked at? I don't know. Fred, do you want to say something? Fred has been studying the site right now. Related, it's a good question. If, if I, I assume everything is planned for just in time, bring a truck in, bring a truck out, yeah. you know, they can... 24 hours a day, all, all year long. Uh, but if there were some uh, sort of natural emergency, if we had a big snowstorm and everything was delayed a week, if we had a blackout, uh, we have all of these containers with liquid natural gas at uh, 260 minus Fahrenheit. Is there a risk of them sitting there for longer than people anticipate? Yeah. That's a very good question. Can you come over to that? I think the main thing to say, I think the main thing to say is that the um, the proponents of this of this facility have not put in any of this kind of stuff on the record. They have not provided any kind of detailed plan, uh, as as was being asked about. You know these huge pipes that would go onto a ship, etc. I mean, you you cannot find out, as far as I can tell. You see you see a plant you see the plant sites in terms of. Uh, the kinds of permits, permits they've had to get about dredging, you know, and not, not impacting the water quality and stuff like that. But you don't see anything 
concrete about the actual equipment they want to use on this site. So I, that was my question when I first thought it, uh, looked at this, which was, are there going to be rail cars lined up outside the plant even waiting to get in, uh, you know, out in the community somewhere? And, um, and there's, no, there's just no answer to this from any official documents yet. And, uh, and you're right to suggest that if there is any holdup of any kind, not only are they losing money in terms of loading their ship, but they're also, um, they're also risking the, the time frame in terms of the, the boil off from the, from the, uh, from the LNG uh, within the, in any containers. Yeah, just, just think of some of those trucks stuck in 95 traffic. <laughs> Okay, go right ahead, this sir. Is, this is for Fred. First responders, that orange book you talked about, if that training isn't really adequate, where do we go? Where do we draw from or do we do we learn as we burn or what? What what's the you know, what's the bottom line? <laughs> well, I, I think the bottom line is that the orange book, the emergency response guidebook, which is what the federal government now defaults to since they won't calculate how far the distance will go into the community, um, it, that said, the, 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 the orange book says evacuate one mile and then think about what you want to do next. <laughs> but get away at least one mile and then think about what you want to do next. The orange book is only about the first 20 minutes of an event. It's only for the very first emergency responders who arrive on the scene. It gives you your very first glimpse of what is, an, what is a reasonable response right away. But I can't see anything about what you would do later. And in fact, what I presume is that the industry is thinking, well, we'll eventually be able to get in some teams of our own experts from facilities nearby or whatever to deal with this. But boy, that is very iffy. As I said earlier about the Plymouth, Washington case, they had to rely on a fire chief for the incident commander who had to drive a half hour to get to the place and didn't know anything about LNG and then took a very precautious stand. I don't think, I've never seen a discussion about what all could happen in case of a serious release that lasted uh, quite a while, that the government just won't talk about it, and the industry certainly is not going to want to talk about it. I just want to add that in New Jersey, we have a bill for train safety for dealing with LNG, ethanol, and um, and Bach and crude, and um, it's, uh, I'll just pull up the number because I don't remember, it's S1883, it's just been reintroduced, it passed the Senate last year, but we couldn't get it through the Assembly because of pushback from CSX and the other railroads. But what that bill would do is it would allow for more advance notice to towns for first responders. It would require that the railroads would have to have um, basically hazmat and safety plans and evacuation plans pre-filed that could actually have to be noticed to the public to, to review. And there would be additional training for first responders. There was originally money going in to help do that additional training, but it was taken out because of politics, but anyway, but so we're trying to get that passed this year, and that would help quite a bit on the New Jersey side. Of it. I got a second backup to that question. I live in Tinicum Township, right across from the, that A bomb site, and quite frankly, we have four railroad crossings in my town. One has a gate on it. We've been trying for the last five years trying to get gates on the rest of the crossing. It may sound silly, but if there's gates coming down, especially at nighttime, that blank tank, the black tanker cars go by, it does enhance your reaction. The Federal Railroad Administration will do nothing for us whatsoever. And we have a, a tanker line that comes through Tinicum every night that goes to the Eddystone Rail Service, which they take bulk oil to that site, put on board, just take it up, up, upstream. So we have a sort of a dilemma above and beyond this. But see, it's tough. It's tough. Let me just mention that the International Association of Firefighters has filed comments with the federal government about their proposed rulemaking to allow. Uh, LNG to be transported in tank cars, in old tank cars, in 100 car unit trains, uh, freely throughout the whole U.S. rail system, which is currently what the Trump administration is pushing through. And um, the, fire, the International Association of Firefighters said, no, this is too dangerous, and, and, and you don't have the science to show that this is safe. Uh, the National Association of State Fire Marshals have said the same thing. Uh, the, the, some of the, union, the rail unions have said the same thing, that we just don't have the science. So, un unfortunately, with the Trump administration doing a favor for the petrochemical industry in ordering promoting of LNG all over the place, this is no, he's no doubt going to continue with this proposed rulemaking to allow rail shipments throughout the United States in tank cars up to 100 
unit, unit, you know, unit uh, train um, uh, links. So that's going to happen, th th that it's going to get okay. Now, the actual reality of that happening depends on the development of a market, and they would probably have to buy, they'd have to create some new tank cars to, to take care of that. But uh, as uh, Tracy was earlier saying about the, the growth, the, the, it's not going to happen overnight, but they are getting their ducks in a row in terms of getting the permits from the Trump administration. And i just add that Skip Elliott, who's the head of PIMSA, who's supposed to be in charge of rail safety and pipeline safety, uh, was vice president for CSX Railroad before he got appointed in the job by the Trump administration. You know, rail safety is a big issue here. And if, uh, well, we know that, as I mentioned earlier, the special permit was given to the company that owns the Gibbstown site to bring by rail LNG in these old rail cars from Bradford County to Gibbstown. But this rulemaking, which I mentioned earlier and was just referenced um, by, by Fred, uh, would allow it anywhere. So those train tracks that you're talking about in Tinicum actually could begin carrying LNG. And I think the other thing we want to keep in mind here is that, as, as Jocelyn said, they're desperate to market this stuff. There's a glut of natural gas. They don't have enough places to, to sell it. And most of these uh, gas companies that are producing gas, the drillers themselves, the midstream, which are the, the pipelines, most of these companies are not really making money now. As a matter of fact, most of them are underwater. They're spending more in capital investment than they're gaining back in their annual returns. They've been given a grace period, basically, uh, by the financial industry. People are, have uh, invested in them. But it's coming to a point where if they don't get some way to get rid of this stuff, the gas that they're producing, many of these companies are going to go under. Some of them already have. Some of the biggest, uh, Chesapeake, uh, you know, went bankrupt and then tried to pull back together. You know, several of these large gas companies who are developing natural gas, looking for their markets, are not going to make it through. And that's why when Fred said, hey, you know, we've got to look at what the market is here and realize we can't allow them to put a marker down here in the Delaware River watershed and start a conduit for a liquefied natural gas that exposes all of us to tremendous risk. We have to fight them off, and maybe the markets will help us in terms of the glut of uh, natural gas, not only domestically, but recently, and on uh, Delaware Riverkeeper Network site, we have links to articles that show that globally there is a glut of liquefied natural gas. Uh, just uh, a month ago, there were LNG tankers floating around the oceans because they couldn't find a port to sell their product. And they were out there, they were supposed to be, and remember what Fred says, it off gases. It's not, so by the time, so they're walk, it's called floating storage and it's actually a thing. So they have floating storage out on the seas looking for places to sell this and yet we want, it, our, we are supposed to allow a company to come in who wants to make a lot of money on the cheap and expose us to all of this risk just so they can get in the game and maybe you know, f make a few bucks. So that's what we need to think about. We need to take advantage of this moment in time, which is really not in the favor of the industry. It's really more in the favor of us, especially with what Jocelyn was talking about, raising awareness about climate impacts. And just Really quickly, um, I do have a few copies of the report that I alluded to from Food and Water Watch about the connection between plastics and LNG exports and how the industry is trying to create these markets. If anyone really wants to read a lot more about that, um, come see me and I can give you a report. It's also why we're trying to get plastic bans in place. Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. Question here in the middle. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the plastic bans. Um, the LNG. Oh, yeah. It is. Uh, I have an article here for the oilprice.com site that follows the oil price. prices. Yes. And they're saying why Europe's gas flood is worsening. They're saying there's no place to put it. They don't have the facilities to receive it. They're just, the markets aren't there anymore, or the Asian market is rejecting it. China's charging. Puerto Rico, by the way, in their plan 
is moving to 100% renewable. They are. So yeah. just so you understand that. Yeah. Maybe you can repeat what he says so other yeah. people can hear and answer. Yeah, you're, just to recap, for in case folks can't hear, you're just sharing that um, on the oil price, sorry, what was the site? It's oil just oilprice.com, oil price yeah, saying that there's about how bad the gas glut is getting and that there's no ports that will accept this and uh, yeah, Asian markets are charging high tariffs and so just, yeah, not, on oilprice.com this problem is being, is explained. Yeah. Yeah, in the back. So, yes, sir. Uh, speaking of plastics, um, this is obviously one of many potential uh, developments along our stretch of the Delaware River. Um, can you just talk a little bit, I'm sure you're all familiar with, that uh, Marcus Hook is on the short list for potentially for a natural gas fueled uh, epic cracker mm -hmm. plant. Um, can you talk about that coming down the pipe as another issue that we need to Right, the question is about the natural gas liquids and Marcus Hook. We actually had a speaker to address this, but he's sick in, in bed and was not able to make it today. Uh, but everyone, I think, is familiar with the Marcus Hook facility. It receives gas through the Mariner East pipeline. There's two pipelines now. One of them is not yet complete. And it brings uh, natural gas from the Marcellus region of Pennsylvania, where the Mark West facility um, operates a processing plant that takes what's called wet gas, gas that has a lot of um, propane or ethane in it, and processes it so it's a liquid, and then moves it uh, by pipeline all the way from the farthest west, western part of Pennsylvania all the way across to Marcus Hook, where it's put on ships now and sent overseas. Uh, it's also legal now, as I mentioned earlier, to move it by rail. That's natural gas liquids, ethane, propane, um, and butane. Butane is a big one, too. They were processing that, for instance, at the PES refinery. Um, and these are basically money makers for an industry, again, that's looking for a way to make money off the products. Um, and in that part of Pennsylvania, the western part and the southern part of Pennsylvania, the gas is, is wet. That's why the Mark uh, West facility is there, and they bleed the wet products off, process them, and send them out here. So it is in itself a dangerous operation. Uh, Fred showed some slides about what can happen when a propane explosion happens in fire. That's all, it's also dangerous. The reason that LNG is even more dangerous is because of what several of our speakers mentioned, is that it expands to 620 times what it is in the, in the container. So we're talking about an exponentially greater amount of potentially explosive or freezing uh, vapor cloud or, or a what Fred described as a, a confined area exploding um, and fire than you would with an, an LPG or uh, natural gas liquids. So if you want to stop the cracking plant, um, start not taking your own bags and starting to get your towns and your, you know, like in New Jersey we have a, a bill that, that passed the Senate to ban thin film plastics. Uh, you know, a lot of cities are doing it too, and that would be one way because, you know, again, ethane is a, one of the leftover processes of when they, you know, you know, they crack the natural gas to create, you know, butane, propane, and uh, methane. So. Yeah, and that's a good point because um, the cracker plant that you're talking about, uh, Shell Cracker Plant, um, in Western Pennsylvania, is supported by the state of Pennsylvania through a lot of incentive grants. Um, that takes the gas and creates little plastic pellets that are then used to make plastic like those, like dry cleaner bag type of thin, filmy plastic. And the supermarket um, one. Yeah, and super, that they use in supermarkets as well. So um, that, that is not what goes to um, Marcus Hook, but what leaves Marcus Hook and goes overseas can be used to make plastic. Yeah, you're talking about a new potential cracker plant that's been proposed for Marcus Hook, an Exxon Mobil plant. Oh. Yeah, so oh, if you know anything there. about, yeah, the new proposal. Yeah, I'm sorry, we don't really have information on the the proposal for the cracker plant, and um, sorry, but we'll be able to share that. Alex is going to send information over. He just was too ill to make it. Yeah. 
Unfortunately, uh, it's, a fed, it's a fed under federal jurisdiction. However, there are things that can be done. And uh, Fred can give a couple examples of uh, cities that fought and got liquefied natu uh, um, natural gas li liquids and or crude oil routed around populated areas based on health and safety. Fred, you want to give an example of that? Well, let me just say that there's been a long fight about this for like 30 years about uh, the routing of the most dangerous cargoes. Um, the, the final resolution of that, and, and so there were, routing reg there were routing regulations proposed by several different localities, but the final federal uh, uh, resolution of that was that the Fed said that states can do a statewide routing designations. Now, states have the power to designate safe routes for selected so it's a number of, um, of hazardous cargoes. So you have to find out whether Pennsylvania has done anything like this or, 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 or New Jersey or whatever. But I, I frankly don't know the routing status. Um, you cannot block a shipment. You have to provide a way for it to get from point X to point Y. But you can, you can force uh, to use less dangerous routing um, if, you can, if you can show that that, in fact, is the case, that you can provide a less safe route the state can do that kind of thing. I don't know how many, I think maybe only 17 or 18 states have actually designated uh, a routing um, pattern at this point. New Jersey. New Jersey. Mine's not actually a question, it's just a statement. Um, but I, one of the first things that happens is, I care about me and what happens in my area and to my family, and I think everybody else does. And the line that that rail line is taking through Pennsylvania and down through New Jersey. Just happens to come within a football field of my house. Mm. But that didn't get the attention of my family or my friends when I started talking about it until I said, and guess what? It's going through your kid's Catholic school and it's 150 feet away. So we've got to talk to the people along the rail line where all those schools and senior citizens facilities are and make all those people, so there's a thousand times what's here today, aware of what's going on. We absolutely agree with you. And we think that this exposure to risk, that this company is exposing all of those communities, you know, thousands of communities, over 200 miles of rail track, and, and urban areas as well as, you know, uh, rivers and streams and uh, very dangerous facilities like nuclear power plants that they go right past. All of that needs to be exposed. And it's one of the things that we've talked about, and maybe we can shift now if we get sort of towards the ends of questions and, and Jeff wants to add something, to talk a little bit about actions like that. I mean, one of the things that we found in studying the routes for the Bakken crew trains in New Jersey was that they're actually going past a lot of very hazardous and dangerous sites, not just you know refineries, but power plants and other things. So if there was an accident or explosion, it could be a catastrophic you know a domino effect because of these other facilities that they're along the route. And it's the same thing with the schools and that. And it, it is really part of you know getting the education out because most people, you know, they want to be an ostrich. They'd rather bury their head in the sand, you know, because it's, you know what's going past them. You know, they may not you know, want to really know about, you know, ignorance is bliss sometimes, except for in this case that ostrich would get quick fried from that LNG um, train going by, so yes. I see we're at four o'clock, so we don't have a lot more time. John's had a hand up for a while. Okay, John. Mm -hmm. How long is the river going to be shut down for the tanker to go out? Well, so... What impact is it going to happen to the bridge? So what happens in Boston, because that's where you know we where it's being done in fact that facility i think is going to be going away it's not being used that much anymore what happens is when the ships are about 10 12 miles off the coast they shut the bridges down and the bridges remain shut until they go into port and then leave and go back out again so in that case those they're not there um, in this case it's an import facility they're not there you know waiting for you know 1,600 trucks to come from, you know, you know, out and, you know, past the Susquehanna River. Um, there, they're, they come in, and it's, and it's literally for four or five hours that everything is shut down, including Logan Airport. And uh, so, but those are quick. This is a much longer situation, and so it could be, and that'll be up to Homeland Security when they determine that. 
but they cannot be open when the ships pass underneath any bridge. That is absolute. The Philadelphia airport is 1.9 miles from the facility. And, and as I said, Logan Airport shuts down when those ships come in. Four hours. So we had a couple ideas here um, organizing along the transportation route, both the rail and the truck. They're different. Um, and then also um, perhaps municipal regulations and municipalities such as Tinicum um, and others um, against the development of this facility. Uh, anybody else want to stand up uh, like, like this lady just did and have any other ideas you want to throw out there? Because we'd be happy to have a uh, follow-up meeting to talk about this or a phone conversation, a webinar. Um, we're, we're hoping to work with Reverend Strand and uh, CEP, uh, uh, the, the Citizens Environmental Partnership, and, and maybe uh, this Widener and, and Scott would want to be involved as well to have follow-up uh, meeting to talk about the actions. Any other ideas? Yes, sir. Maybe we could talk a little more about the alternatives. Good suggestion. All right. We should be writing these things. We are taping this, so if anything someone says, uh, our videographer at Rogers in the back there is taping this. He's also been live streaming it, by the way. Um, so uh, we, we do have your suggestion. Any other suggestions people I, wanted to make? I have a question. Yes. Please, about the transit of that ship coming up the river, uh, everything has to be shut down four hours prior and until it gets to the dock. No, in that case, it's the ships come in, it takes about four hours because they're just offloaded. Here, it'll be, up, it'll be determined by Homeland Security, but they cannot be open as long as the bridge can go, as long as the ship is going under a bridge either way. And I'm not sure what they're going to decide when they're at dock, because that's going to be up to Homeland Security. In, in, in Massachusetts, everything's shut down while they're at dock. Well, my argument says the transit time from the Delaware Bay up to the Philadelphia region it's a, good, a couple hours, number one. You got the Delaware Memorial Bridge, you got the Tumba yeah. Valley Bridge, yeah. you yeah. Yeah. the airport. Yeah. That would be a, a disaster of epic proportions, so shutting down traffic just to get that ship up here. It'd be better to be built somewhere off the coast somewhere where it doesn't yeah. have an infrastructure, damage other infrastructure. That's absurd. Well, what's happened, what, what happened is they tried to do that off the coast four times, and four times the different governors of New York and New Jersey, because of adjoining status, turned them down. So she understand that they also tried to put an LNG terminal down in Greenwich Township uh, on the Delaware, where the Delaware River comes across, and the Sierra Club in the state of Delaware sued New Jersey and BP and won the Supreme Court and stopped it. So that's why they're looking for a new location. But that's more research that we do hope to be able to get answers to. What exactly will happen? How will other shipping events and communities be affected by the ships? One more thing I hate to say to take up time. If they could put windmill farms off the coast and operate that, why can't they put a facility that out there where it's protected and it doesn't terrorize well, it's, it's not protected. Because it's not, so just so you understand, and I go back to the battle when they tried to do that in the 80s, and they found out that if there was a leak out there that there's a good chance that a big cloud, because the water's cold, will stay close to the ground and actually move towards Long Island. And so... Well, they could have sensors, etc. The There's nighters out there yeah. to stop from happening. So well, if you have a major leak, I mean, you could talk about the leak, but that was one of the big yeah. issues about that. So put it in our backyard. No, we shouldn't be putting it anywhere, is basically. Well, we're, we're expensive. Well, no, we shouldn't be putting it anywhere. That's the point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, the point is we don't need this. We, we and remember, it's not for us. This is to go, you know, Overseas. Yeah, you know, wherever, you know. Right. Any other last thoughts you won't before see we head out? Of that gas People here. are starting to leave, so why don't you come on up and we can talk one on one rather than continuing because we're already ten minutes past. Thank you all. Thank you for coming.